in these seeds. And after implementing early seed pack in 1997, he reported chronological data for the ensuing four years. And he clearly showed that during these four years, uh, as the use of early seed pack increased, seed pack failure almost became half. The use of surfactant decreased, and he was able to decrease the incidence of BPD threefold. And he continues to do well, and his numbers are almost similar to what we have at Columbia. So based on what we have, ta have talked about, um, I can conclude that the initial stabilization of nasal CPAP and provision of rescue surfactant only when it's necessary is at least as beneficial and quite possibly preferred over the standard therapy of intubating all infants at risk in the delivery room and subsequent support with mechanical ventilation. In fact, the Committee of Fetus and Newborn in the most recent policy statement on surfactant replacement therapy for preterm neonates published in 2014 has stated, and I'm going to read this verbatim, using CPAP immediately after birth with subsequent selective surfactant administration should be considered as an alternative to routine intubation with prophylactic surfactant or early surfactant administration in preterm infants level of evidence category one, all from randomized controlled trial. Further, preterm infants treated with early CPAP alone are not at increased risk or adverse outcomes if treatment with surfactant is delayed or not given. Again, level of evidence category one. So moving gears, uh, we are all aware of the physiological effects of CPAP. CPAP increases trans pulmonary pressure and functional residual capacity. It prevents alveolar collapse, decreases intrapulmonary shunt, and improves lung compliance. CPAP also helps in conserving surfactant, prevents pharyngeal wall collapse, and stabilizes the chest wall. It increases the airway diameter and sprints the airway. That way it can be utilized well with airway diseases such as meconium aspiration syndrome. CPAP also splints the diaphragm. For me, more importantly, CPAP stimulates lung growth, as I've shown you earlier, and bubble CPAP has high frequency <coughs> ventilation of, through the stochastic resonance. I'll talk about that later. Moving on to the desirable features and the major components of the CPAP system, there are three major components. It is an humidified circuit for continuous flow of inspired gases. The nasal interface to connect the CPAP circuit to the infant's airway. And then is the mode of CPAP generation. I'll briefly talk about each one of them. Some of the salient features of the setup, oxygen and compressed air sources provide inspired gases at desired inspired oxygen concentration and the flow meter controls the rate of flow. The minimum flow rate should be sufficient enough to prevent rebreathing of CO2 and is usually two and a half times the infant's minute ventilation. The flow should also compensate for leaks around the connector and the CPAP prompt and usually a flow rate of five to 10 liters per minute is sufficient. When blended oxygen is not available, which is could be the case in many of the developing world, one can use the separate oxygen flow, uh, oxygen and air flow meters, and then the oxygen air flow chart to, to figure out how to get the desired amount of oxygen. For example, to deliver 50% oxygen at six liter flow, all you need to do is use three liters of oxygen and four liters of air to get 50% oxygen. So it's very simple if you don't have blenders, which would be an issue. These inspired gases need to be warmed. They need to be humidified to, before they're delivered to the infant. This helps in avoiding the mucosal injury. Talking about the nasal interfaces to connect to the CPAP circuit, Several interfaces are available. Various nasal prongs manufactured by Hudson, Baby Plus, Inca, Rager, Fisher Pekka, Saipap, Arabella, Neopap are available. 
nasal mass and nasal cannula vapotum are also used. It can also be delivered by nasal pharyngeal tube and endotracheal tube. When you're trying to pick an inter interface, you have to ensure that the nasal prongs follow the contour of the nasal cavity, which is curved as shown in the figure up here. The nasal interface with the curved prongs shown at the top here is a much better fit than the straight prong interface at the bottom of the screen. So if you want to direct CPAP, you want to direct it to the nasal passages, not to the brain. Uh, there are several cannulas available, and just to share with you, the Hudson cannula, which we use at Columbia, uh, they come in six sizes, from zero to five, um, and the manufacturer has corresponding birth weights, uh, which match with the size of the cannula for the use. Similarly, the Baby Plus, um, which is also a curved cannula, they come in eight sizes, from zero to seven. The advantage of this particular brand is they're made of silicon, so they're not PVC and they're latex free. We use the two extremes, size seven and size zero for very tiny babies at Columbia University. Ram cannula is being used increasingly to deliver CPAP due to its ease of use. If you look at the FDA approval, it was only approved for oxygen delivery as an oxygen delivery cannula and not as a pressure delivering cannula. If you look at the data on the mean airway pressure that is generated at various CPAP settings with 60 to 80 percent of occlusion as recommended by the manufacturer and a closed mouth, how cannula only delivers it's delivered less mean airway pressure compared to the short binasal cannula. Further, binasal cannula prongs offer less resistance. It's almost three-fold less than the ground cannula. You look at the smallest ground cannula size, uh, commercially available as preterm, it has 400 times the high resistance when compared with the short binasal cannula. What about the high flow nasal cannula? Um, I think this data from Lavizari and his colleagues very clearly demonstrates that the end expiratory pressure that is generated with using this cannula, it correlates very poorly with the flow. If you look at, for example, at the weight adjusted flow of four liters per minute, high flow nasal cannula pressure could vary from anywhere from two centimeters of water to seven centimeters of water. I would be very skeptical of using high flow nasal cannula as a pressure delivery device. If you look at the <coughs> uh, data on electrical activity of diaphragm during CPAP use and high flow nasal cannula use, and it's very clear uh, that the use of high flow nasal cannula is associated with increased diaphragmatic activation compared with nasal CPAP, and also the respiratory rate and cycle dynamic suggests that CPAP may provide more effective respiratory support than the high flow nasal cannula. A word of caution, there are safety concerns as subcutaneous emphysema, orbital air, and pneumostaphylus have been reported with the use of high humidity high flow nasal cannula. So now that I've spoken about the interface, I'm going to briefly talk about how to generate the pressure. So, so one can use a constant flow system, and the most simplest one is a water seal system that utilizes threshold resistor principle. The pressure is determined by the force applied to the surface area, and generated pressure is independent of the flow. Bubble CPAP system such as fisher Pekal, Babi Plus, Airway Development, homemade systems are most commonly used. Another form of constant flow system is the flow opposition with a variable threshold resistor valve. This is what we do with the ventilator CPAP. If the patient expiratory flow opposes a constant flow from the nasal prong and generates the CPAP. In contrast, 
the variable flow system, there is a flow opposition with fluidic flow reversal during inspiration uh, during expiration, where the gas is entrained during inspiration to maintain stable pressures. And in expiration, the expiratory flow is diverted via a separate fluidic flip flop, flip flop valve. The Arizona generator and the infant flow driver are typical examples of this system. And to illustrate that further, in the variable flow infant, <clears throat> infant flow driver, during inspiration, the flow is converted to pressure. It reduces the work of breathing and maximizes the pressure stability at the nasal interface. However, during expiration, the flow is flipped away from the nasal prongs to the expiratory tube. Thus, the residual gas pressure provided by the continuous gas flow creates a stable theta pressure during the whole respiratory cycle. It makes sense. However, limited randomized and non randomized clinical study in preterm infants comparing the infant flow nasal system and the simple single prong system have found no significant differences in short-term or long-term outcomes in physiological variables. So having talked about the three components of the CPAP system, I'm going to move more towards creating a basis for benefit of bubble CPAP system as the preferred method to deliver positive airway pressure. Um, this is illustrated very nicely by Jane Pillow and her group who demonstrated that the bubble CPAP system enhances lung volume and gas exchange in preterms much better. What they did, they intubated preterm lamps of 133-day gestation. Uh, the term gestation in sheep is about 152 days. And then randomized them to bubble CPAP of 8 or 12 liters per minute flow or constant pressure CPAP via the ventilator circuit. And what they showed was the animals treated with bubble CPAP, shown here in solid rectangles, had enhanced ventilation by having a better pH and lower PCO2 compared to constant pressure CPAP, shown here in open circles. Further, bubble CPAP animals also demonstrated improved oxygenation and enhanced oxygen extraction compared to the constant pressure system. In their study, they were not able to show any differences between 8 or 12 liters flow. So what could be the reasons or physiological explanation for improved performance on bubble CPAP? I think the more efficient utilization of inspired oxygen in the bubble CPAP group is very suggestive of increased airway patency. The promotion of airway opening events likely explains the short-term improvement in respiratory physiology. Lung volume recruitment and surfactant secretion may be improved with, by superimposing the stochastic resonance effect from the variable pressure oscillation associated with water seal bubble CPAP on the underlying sub-threshold biological breathing pattern. <clears throat> How about the effectiveness of bubble CPAP during the post-extubation period, Gupta and colleagues randomized 140 infants of 24 to 29 week gestation to infant flow driver CPAP and or bubble CPAP in the post-extubation period. The primary outcome was successful extubation at least at 72 hours. And as you can see, the proportion of infants in both the groups who achieved successful extubation for 72 hours was very similar. However, if you look at the medium duration of CPAP support in infants ventilated for less than 14 days, it was 50% shorter in infants who were on bubble CPAP. So bubble CPAP has the potential of being effective in the acute phase of the disease and also during um, when the babies are recovering and are being weaned off the respiratory so the next question is, are all bubble CPAP devices created the same way? I think Pori and colleagues recently reported a study comparing um, volume oscillations delivered um, to a lung model using four different CPAP systems. 
the homemade system, the Fisher Pecan system, the Bobby Plus system, and airway development system. And what they looked at was the magnitude of lung volume oscillations as a result of fire's flow. You can see the Fisher Pecan system, shown here in black, provided the greatest magnitude of lung volume oscillation than compared to any other devices at all of the bias flows. The magnitude of lung volume oscillation increased at bias flows above four in three systems, the fisher pecan the homemade, and the airway development. And in contrast, uh, the um, body plus system uh, at flows higher than four, there was a decrease in the oscillation. So one of the reasons is the airway development and body plus system utilize the diffuser in their bottle. And that diffuser attenuates the oscillations and decreases the interaction between the air and water. So it seems from this, their data, the fisher Pecal and the homemade system um, perform much better. In addition, if you look at flow rates over eight liters per minute, the homemade and the fisher Pecal system generate second bandwidth frequencies at 54 to 76 hertz and 61 to 71 hertz respectively that may promote enhanced lung recruitment especially in an unhealthy lung. The airway development and body plus system don't do that. So what are my clinical recommendations? All spontaneously breathing preterm infants with respiratory distress syndrome weighing less than 1500 grams should be allowed time to demonstrate if they can achieve acceptable ventilation and oxygenation with nasal CPAP. During this time, I put that in bold red, these infants must be closely monitored. If ventilation is not improving, or oxygenation is worsening or inadequate, with an FiO2 of more than 0 0.6, infants should be intubated and given the factor. What about CPAP failure? This is a big concern when CPAP is used as a primary mode of respiratory support. In fact, Clyde, and Clyde Wright and his colleagues reported a very high incidence of CPAP failure at five to seven days when CPAP was used as a primary mode of respiratory support in extremely low birth weight infants enrolled in major randomized controlled trials. We recently reported a 10-year practice trend between the years 2009 and 2018 at Columbia Life Centers that practice gentle respiratory support strategy, which uses CPAP immediately after birth with selective ventilation and surfactant administration shown here in blue. And they compared our data with the VON. Uh, VON is a network of more than 800 NICUs, and many of these are type C NICUs. So we compared this gentle strategy with the data from the type C. And you can see over this 10 recent years, um, the use of CPAP is much, uh, is much higher at Columbia Life Centers and compared to the Type C1 centers. But interestingly, the use of CPAP is increasing at all these centers. The use of ventilation is much lower at Columbia and it's slightly going down at other places. When you look at the treatment with surfactant, um, again, low at Columbia Life Centers, and um, maybe a little dent in here, um, postnatal steroids seem to be coming back. But when you look at the outcome, that is the incidence of oxygen use, whether you look at 28 days postnatal or 36 weeks uh, postmenstrual age, it's still very high at these centers. And more and more babies are being discharged home on oxygen in warm type C centers. The question now, which I have is, how come they're using CPAP much more, ventilating less, and still the BP is not going down? So I think that brings me down, and especially after having established the basis for bubble CPAP to the main crunch of this talk, which is the fine art of practicing bubble CPAP. I mentioned earlier, it doesn't happen overnight. And I would like to share some practical aspects of nasal CPAP application in the next 10, 15 minutes and share with you some strategies for success. I refer to them as 10 pearls of bubble nasal CPAP 
success? First and foremost, choosing the appropriate size of nasal prong. Choose the correct size of prong in order to provide effective nasal CPAP and, and avoid erosion of the nasal septum. Both Hudson and Bobby Plus have recommended prong sizes by weight. Other manufacturers also have recommendations for the individual prong size. The correct size of prongs should snugly fit into infant's nail without pinching the septum or causing any blanching. How should you fix the nasal interface? Uh, their circuit tubing can be fixed easily with a snugly fitting cap with rubber bands and Velcro, uh, rubber bands and safety pins, or one can use Velcro. In bigger infants, curly bandage can help to maintain the shape of the head while the infant is on CPAP. And the bottom line is, when secure, the interface should move when the baby moves the head. So everything should move all together. <clears throat> Further, to secure the nasal interface, one can use a pre-cut spindle or a split Velcro mustache. This, and this is the rough surface of the Velcro, um, which gets placed on the skin. And then the smooth part of the Velcro is placed on the nasal cannula as shown. And what you want to make sure is after you put the prongs in the nostrils, then there should be a space between the nasal septum and the nasal cannula. That is the crucial thing. And I think that's one thing which keeps <clears throat> the incidence of septal injury very, very low or almost none at Columbia University. Tegaderm and duoderm, thin duoderm base can assist in stabilizing the mustache and the cannula, particularly if the infant has a lot of secretions. Homemade to seal or commercially available if you have enough financial uh, cannulity can be used to obtain a good nasal seal. Mustache and nasal cannula, I keep say, I will repeat this multiple times, should never, never touch the septum. When properly positioned, the corrugated tubing should not, not, not touch infant skin. There should be no natural pressure on the nasal septum, and a small space should always be present between the tip of the septum and the nasal cannula connecting the prongs. How can you optimize the CPAP delivery? A small neck roll goes a long way under the infant's neck to prevent neck flexion and airway obstruction. Chin straps, as shown here, or pacifiers can be applied as needed to maintain airway pressure. They can also decrease the leak up from the gases and they promote bubbling. Importantly, um, vigilant care is needed to ensure correct positioning of the CPAP prompt at all times to avoid septal irritation. The nasal cavities, orifice, and stomach should be gently suctioned every three to four hours as needed to improve ventilation and decrease abdominal distension. When you're performing nasal or oral suctioning, prior to removing the prop, one should ensure to cover the eye. This will prevent contaminations from nasal secretion. Infant's position should be changed every three hours. Infant can be prone, placed prone, supine, or lateral. All positions are acceptable, but again, Always ensure that there is no lack additional pressure on the nasal septum or the face from the tubing. It is essential to systematically check the CPAP delivery system multiple times during the day. The inspired gases should be well humidified with temperature around 37 degrees to prevent irritation of mucous membranes, avoid mucous flooding, and to mobilize the secretion. The condensed water in the Tubing should be periodically drained as needed. One has to ensure that the distal end of the expiratory tube is always insert, inserted to the appropriate length below the liquid surface in the bubbler so that we're generating the desired CPAP. The liquid in the bubble, the bubbler can be either sterile water or we use 20.25% acetic acid, uh, which has the potential to decrease the risk for pseudomonas infection. And we recommend that the nasal CPAP circuit should be changed at least once a week. One has to ensure that there is no gastric distension. 
for which a feeding tube should be placed to permit gastric venting and decompression. This decreases the excessive pressure from the diaphragm and improves the lung expansion. The tube should be suctioned every three hours if infant is not entirely fed or before feed if the infant is being fed. And we tend to check the tube position and patency every 12 hours. If infant is on CPAP, infant can be fed by a nipple, a vase, or continuous feed. CPAP is not a contraindication for not feeding. Also, early parental involvement in nipple feeding while the infant is still on his CPAP, it facilitates the bonding for same reason, and skin-to-skin -skin care is to be encouraged when infant is on nasal CPAP, as you see in the picture shown above. Coming to how to wean nasal CPAP, I'm going to share you the stability criteria for redness of nasal CPAP when we be at Columbia. You know, for me, the best indicator is when the nurses, they give the bath at the night time, they leave me a message saying, this baby is ready for um, coming off CPAP. But we have objective criteria. We wean CPAP only after infants are more than 30 weeks. They're not on any supplemental oxygen for at least 48 hours. They're completely asymptomatic with CDA, which could be there still. There are no apneic episodes. There's no suggestion of infection. There's no significant bradycardia or desaturation that require intervention. Less than two self-limiting bradycardia or desaturations in the past 12 hours are okay. And the oxygen saturation has to be more than 90% on room air. How do we mean? Um, it has been done using three different approaches. You can completely take off CPAP when the infant is stable on room air without any respiratory distress. Uh, um, you can cycle where the infant comes off for a period and then goes back, gradually increasing the time off and reducing the time on. And this way, infant can be completely weaned off. And the third method is switching to a nasal slow nasal cannula uh, when the CPAP is off. Uh, but we, we don't know what pressures we are giving with this nasal cannula. Um, so uh, has this been evaluated? Uh, these methods have been evaluated nicely um, uh, in a randomized controlled trial, looking at all these three methods. And it was very clear that method one, which is complete wean with intentions to stay off, it resulted in lower time to wean, lesser total number of days on CPAP, Supplemental oxygen, lower incidence of DPD, and even the length of hospitalization was decreased, and infants were discharged at a much lower corrected gestational age. So, if you're going to wean, we do the same. <coughs> uh, we wean infants off with intentions to keep the infants off once the infant. Obviously, um, I'll talk about uh, managing the failure in a minute, but another important aspect is avoiding the potential complications um, with CPAP use. These complications include nasal obstruction from secretion or improper application of nasal prongs, gastric distension from swallowing of excessive air, nasal septum erosion as shown here. Um, this could be prevented by choosing the right side, vigilant care to keep the camera off the nasal septum at all times. I've seen some, some of the units, they try to put something. This is an absolute no-no. The small surface area, if you protect it over here, if even there is a little pressure, it's really going, because of its small nature, it's going, it's going to put a lot of pressure, and there will be that. So these two are definitely a no-no. How do you amplify and manage nasal CPAP? CPAP failure can occur during the acute phase of RDS or during the recovery when nasal CPAP is being used to wean. CPAP prior to starting wet mechanical ventilation, it is, it is important and imperative to show number one, the blood gases are compatible with the, how the infant looks. Before you abandon CPAP, it is important to rule out the proper application of CPAP, poor fitting prongs, nasal obstruction due to secretion, airway of obstruction from flex neck, gastric distension, and too frequent handling of an unstable infant also doesn't help. If the CPAP system is found to be working properly and oxygen is still in, in, inadequate, in select group of infants, um, 
may, they may benefit from increasing the end expiratory pressure to up to be used up to 8 millimeters of mercury. CPAP failure can occur immediately after weaning, a coming off CPAP, or as late as 12 to 24 hours later. If the infant is experiencing frequent episodes of apnea, bradycardia, desaturation, or develops distress while off CPAP, the CPAP should be should be taken off. Um, if it, this happens while the baby is off, then the CPAP should be placed back again. So to summarize the use of CPAP, there are some take-home practice points. Use of nasal CPAP as an initial mode of respiratory support in critically ill, very low birth weight infants is associated with lower incidence of chronic lung disease. Short binasal prongs are effective and convenient patient device interfaces for delivery of CPAP in newborn infants with respiratory distress. Bubble nasal CPAP represents the simplest form of CPAP that may offer physiological advantage over other CPAP systems because of its effective lung volume recruitment and efficient gas exchange in the presence of low lung compliance. Use of correct CPAP devices, attention to details during CPAP delivery, and bedside care your experience are the key to nasal CPAP success. If you practice all this, all your patients are going to say, I love my CPAP. Thank you for your patience. I will take questions and I have my still um, address up here. If there are any questions related to CPAP or elsewhere, I can be of any help um, to anyone uh, who's taking care of babies all over the world. I'll be glad to help. Okay. That was a very uh, fantastic and uh, very informative lecture. In fact, I, I must use the word fantastic because even after practicing for 30 years, I still found a few points uh, extremely important. And uh, I will ask you all those deadly questions after my faculty uh, asks you questions. So be prepared in the end for a small uh, fusillade of uh, very potentially dangerous questions. And I go to Dr. Mamo. Uh, yeah, there is a little bit of psycho, but I'll try my best to hear the question. <coughs> One of the slides you put uh, more than 30. Uh, do you advise in, in down to which gestation and age? It is always less than 30, more than 30 weeks, or you try it with less down to 30 weeks? So, it's hard to uh, There's a lot of echo, but let me see if I got. Is the question is the question saying how low can you go in gestation um, to use CPAP? Is that right? Uh, one of the slides was showing for the success between more than 30. Okay, so let me. I'm just going to say in my talk. I was hoping that question would come up, and I have some Columbia experience. So now, if you look at the data on this slide, um, this tells you the CPAP experience with increasing post menstrual age. I'll show you the same data. So if you look at with the increasing gestational age, a post menstrual age from 23 weeks to 34, that's what this data shows. And what it shows is over 28 weeks, you can start almost all babies on CPAP. Sorry. Almost all babies can be started with CPAP. And it's successful in almost all the babies. You can see the success rate at Columbia over 28 to 7 weeks is in high 90s. Even when you look at babies less than 28 weeks, as low as 23 weeks, CPAP can be started in as low as about 50%, and it is successful in half of them. The, the, there is another issue, how do you define who it will be success? But I think for now, um, as, we, as everyone is working towards that, um, we have to keep in mind that unless you try, you would not know. And in our institution, in the gestational post-menstrual age ranges 23 to 34 range, uh, one third of infants um, are ventilated and two thirds are managed with CPAP. 
And if you look at the same data by the weight category, less than 800 grams, um, again, uh, CPAP can be tried in significant number of infants and is almost successful in about, I would say, 40 to 50 percent of babies. Over 800 grams can be tried in almost all babies. Our overall CPAP success rate ranges between high 70s to 80. There are other institutions who have similar results. Hani Ali is close to 75 percent, and many people who practice them. So I don't. I think the major issue comes is um, how to figure out which baby, and we've tried to do that. And um, I I can share that, but let me see if I can take more questions. Hi, Dr. Rakesh. Uh, first of all, thanks for the very nice uh, lecture. I'm Dr. Lodeta, I'm here to talk to you. Just on that same slide, uh, going to the tiny babies below 800 grams, when you say success rate, CPAP success, does that mean these babies did not require mechanical ventilation or intubation? Is that so there is a lot of, oh, so it's very hard to comprehend the question. Maybe somebody can speak that a little slowly. Uh, and the, the mic which we were using earlier was much better. It's the same mic actually. Right. Okay. I'll, I'll speak slowly. So hey, that's much better. Success. Rajiv, your voice is, can you repeat the question, please? So the question asked by Dr. Bhutti was uh, what success rate when they say yeah, yeah. means they did not so require to to be find the success rate means that uh, yeah, so they are not ventilated at all or at some point in time in the first two weeks there was a need for a assisted ventilation. I think we published this in many others that, that if CPAP in the management of acute RDS, if it's going to fail, the failure will happen in the first 24 to 48 hours. And uh, it's early failure. And the data which I just shared with you was up to 72. And um, uh, <clears throat> our criteria for failure are very similar to what we, I, I mentioned in my recommendation. So uh, most failures, uh, if you're using it for acute RDS, Happened in the first 48 hours. Yeah, sure. The other thing I wanted to ask is I mean, there's enough data that surfactant below 28 weeks is very effective, and there's no doubt about this hundreds of randomized controlled trials. But when you, in your experience at Columbia, when you have a 725, 26 weeker, and they, you put the baby on the CPAP after three days, they fail CPAP, they need mechanical ventilation and you intubate them. Do you still give surfactant even if it's more than three days? And do you think that's gonna help or does it help? Is it not too late to give surfactant rather than intubate, give surfactant in a 25 weeker, extubate early? That strategy would be better or just putting maybe on CPAP and then failing after three days and then trying to intubate when you know the surfactant is not gonna be very effective. Can you just repeat it, please? This question was a very nice question. In fact, the sex and my sex are some cases and some women. It's almost two thirds of the black state. Two thirds of these babies below 750 grams eventually ran the bottom of That was the black state that Martin Lewis talked about. Right? Uh, Mudit is explaining the question. In that if we have to use the fact of initially new surfactant and you fail after two days to go back to mechanical ventilation. Or you ventilate, come off the fact, like come off the ventilator and put on the fact for the second one. The third thing is after 72 hours, if you are looking at the third you surfactant at all, you put him on assisted uh, ventilation. So I, I'll start off this, uh, I'm sorry I don't have that those set of slides. There's very nice old data where they looked at 25 to 29 weekers and they compared them with uh, surfactant sufficient um, in term infants and they looked at the uh, alveolar surfactant amount in preterm infants between 25 to 29 weeks who got surfactant and who didn't get surfactant and they looked at several time points up to I think about two weeks of age and it's very clear 
that infants uh, who get surfactant, obviously their surfactant levels match the ones at term, in, but the infants who don't get surfactant, by the age day three, their sur alveolar surfactant or their intrinsic surfactant production then becomes more of a function of postnatal age than the postmenstrual age. So the baby can, and we all know that, when we give surfactant, one dose is not enough. So I think the big question comes is, can you sustain the baby during that period and how effective? And there is a lot of data um, we're now emerging that even few mechanical breaths in the delivery room, intubation, the, the process of putting in a tube, that's why Lisa and um, MIST have been around, that all these are big components for development of chronic lung disease. So if you can expand the lung physiologically, and keep it open um, with CPAP, there's probably nothing better because that's what you're trying to do with the intubation. Um, surfactant, yes, it's a separate issue. Um, and if the lung is not sufficient, and uh, it's been shown that some of these babies, particularly the ones who fail, um, they need surfactant. And I wish we um, could identify these babies much earlier. In our cohort, we have looked at, and I'm showing you some of the data, which are the variables which are associated with surfactant failure. And you can see the success is in green, the failures are in blue. So if you are less than 26 weeks, you're less than 800 grams, you needed positive pressure ventilation in the delivery room, or your AGO2 gradient is more than 180. I think the biggest one is the severe RDS on the initial chest X-ray. That's the baby you need to watch very closely. That's the one who's going to, if you don't have anything, and I think if you are, obviously if you're starting with a CPAP therapy in, initially, and that's what we recommend, I think the units should develop their own strategy. Many people start off, you know, using this approach in first with a little bigger infants, more than 1,000, and they get good with the CPAP use, then they lower. And I, the, the results have been replicated at so many places. We've looked at this data again, Individually, if you see, there we have looked at other things where, like this is a different cohort, less than 1,000 grams here. And if you look at the overall incidence of chronic lung disease, it's 9.6% at Columbia. And if you look at comparable born institutes, it's more than 50%. And none of the factors such as inter interpartum antibiotics, TBS, less than 26, severe RDS, individually, other than the severe RDS on X-ray, has a predictive value of 81. But when you look at the cumulative, you take severe RDS on the chest X-ray in 26 weeks where the bad pH of less than this, high oxygen requirement, and then you can see you can increase. I think it is, um, that's why I think um, CPAP is particularly bubble nasal CPAP. Um, it's not just science, it is an art. So it's a combination of science and um, unfortunately, we cannot do a comparative trial at Columbia uh, to show that it's superior. But I'm sure some of you. So I, I don't think so we are there. People are trying to look at things like, you know, looking at the um, um, gastric aspirate for lamellar bodies and basing surfactant or um, insured for those babies. It can be quickly done. But I don't think so we are there. The aerosolized surfactant delivered by our CPAP would be thought that was going to be great. We participated in that trial for the smaller babies. And my experience with the device which we used was not that very good because it seemed that all the aerosol was coming out of the mouth and very minimal probably reached the baby. I haven't seen the results of that study, um, but I think that would be an effective way not to touch the airway at all and yet find a way of delivering uh, CPAP, uh, the surfactant um, so I'm, I'm pretty sure we will see, we've come a long way and uh, we will see that soon. One component of this question was the baby, I mean, you said most of them failed in the first 24 to 48 hours. If in case they failed after 48 hours, do you still give them the Um I, I think if they get cute, that's my personal advice, if they get cute and they have their, uh, um, they obviously, when they fail, they're on 60%. Yes, then we would give them a uh, quick uh, doses. We don't extubate them right away, but our uh, focus is to get the tube out in the next 24 hours. So, brief ventilation.
And we've seen in our data set too, by doing that, we do not increase any morbidity. And you've seen what I showed you of uh, the recommendation of surfactant replacement from the committee of features and new bonds. Hi, Dr. Atkins, Mani Dr. Atkins, I'm a neurologist. Are you able to hear me? No. Better to speak there. You look like Jeter the walking, so I think we saw you. Have you seen his uh, uh, yeah. outfit like Jeter Dr. in the 60s? Hi, Dr. Atkins. Uh, this is my better, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, it's a wonderful uh, presentation. I believe you cleared so many things, so many questions uh, are answered, really. Uh, my my concern is, you know, the success of CPAP, as you are already mentioned, it is the scale, really. And, and the interface, if it is not chosen appropriately, we, we eventually fail. This is what we have seen. And the entire team has to be geared for that. And uh, usually, you sort so many modalities of giving CPAP. Is it, uh, have you concern about the nasopharyngeal CPAP? You know, at the delivery room, it is mostly easier. People put and then bring to the unit and then you start a uh, you know positive uh, CPAP in a proper setting and a proper system. Uh, do you, have you ever tried nasopharyngeal? We, we, we haven't done that and the reason I can tell you why, um, number one, we, uh, Columbia is unique that we have a resuscitation, we have a small EQ in the delivery room. So all our admissions, Preterm, non preterm, cardiac, we take care of all of them. All those admissions are in that in that area. And literally it takes us three to five seconds to bring the baby into that area. It's a very controlled. So the baby goes on CPAP within five minutes. So we are set up to start nasal CPAP right away. The reason I wouldn't recommend using the perennial CPAP, if you look at um, the resistance, the resistance is directly proportional to the length of the device and inversely proportional to the square of radius. So that's why the short binasal prongs, and I think there's a Cochrane review on that too, binasal prongs are much superior. But putting this question, um, putting all this in the context you asked, I think the one, yes, I don't agree with you more. It is a complete team approach. Physicians can buy it. If the nurses and RTs don't buy it, it's not going to work. The whole team, because the people who are at the bedside 24-7 are the ones who have to implement it and have to buy it. And I means um, I leave it to the team. You know, you find what works in your system and then just stick to it. And if you feel that because of the proximity or how you're resuscitating, you can do quick pharyngeal CPAP in the um, um, delivery room and convert to if that works for you, and so long as you're not touching the airway, you're getting plus points. And as you get better with your implementation of a binasal prong, uh, you can be, see what's happening is, means we all know, now if you look at the algorithm for uh, uh, resuscitation um, of targeting oxygen, even the NRP is saying, you know, at one minute, you should, oxygen saturation should be in this range, two minutes, it should be slightly more. So if, most people, when, you come, when it comes to practice, we know in utero saturation is about 67%. The next number any caretaker wants to see is 100 without forgetting that, you know, there is numbers which come between 67 and 100. And I personally believe when you do that with the use of CPAP, you're expanding the lung more physiologically, causing less narrow trauma. Uh, whether you can achieve that with uh, nasopharyngeal tube, uh, we haven't looked at it, and the reason I mentioned um, that we have it set up right in the delivery room, so we start CPAP within three to five minutes of birth. So, um, and that can be done, and I can share with you how we transport babies from that area. Uh, we transport babies on blended oxygen, so we are not giving most of our babies. You won't believe, and uh, this is true for other places too, and perhaps this is the experience at your end too. Maybe that in room air, whether you're ventilating or CPAP. And uh, I think it, then we deal with it in some babies after 48 to 72 hours, they start saying failure, and then we just we went get, get into this cycle. So we don't see much of that with the 
early use of paper and use of surfactant as the question was asked before uh, i mean to use surfactant later like after 72 hours or say say fourth day if the baby is reintubated is it a possibility or is it going to help for the uh, future mm. morbidities like bpds and all this or most most of the story complete the question sorry and the doses of surfactant uh, how much you, you should recommend because sometimes we see when the babies are not improving people use multiple doses of surfactants like uh, three to four doses which we don't see a reality but you know in, in practice people do it what what should be your opinion on that so you know the surfactants used i would say if you if you look up the which particular group of babies who need surfactants and these are essentially your less than 1000 gram babies who yes, will yes. get surfactants and if you and then surfactant volume is an issue and uh, i don't know what's available in uae and other countries but in united states of the surfactant available the most concentrated form of surfactant is curesur and um, that and if we are going to give we will give a full dose of 200 mg per kg um is 2.5 ml and um, to the baby and usually um, we all know that the is in in infants um, the surfactant metabolism is uh, 90% of the cycle surfactant is recycled so if you give one dose but, uh, that's why most of the places uh, babies only receive one dose that surfactant stays for a long time it's recirculated and all and um, if you are giving multiple doses and it's not affected it wasn't working in the first place and um, so uh, the management Uh, the need for surfactant going to the first part of the question um, became during the acute phase, and I said most of the failures happen um, in the first 48 hours. Failures which happen later on uh, have multifactorial causes, and um, surfactant deficiency could be one. And uh, you need to figure out what's the underlying cause. If there is oxygen need and all, um, surfactant can be attempted. But I think many of those babies, if they're failing late. one has to I and mean, this is still a controversial area um the fda does not approve or the the use of inhaled nitric oxide in preterm infants but um, now what we would do if a baby is failing at 48 to 72 hour um we would get an echocardiogram look for signs of pulmonary hypertension and uh, depending on what we find we will accordingly manage the baby and have you ever tried uh, edema surfactant no we haven't done but i know studies have been done um the data is much more stronger um with the current technique um the, the australian uh, technique and the german they do the with the catheter 17 gauge catheter and i was recently at a conference in india um and uh, they, i there i saw this uh, a new catheter um which the german uh, the dutch have and it, you can bend that catheter a little bit for better but um, lma has been done but i think your delivery you what you want to do is do an intratracheal delivery um and i don't think so it's as effective um with the lma compared to lisa thank you so much thank you Yeah, I have a question on uh, high flow. I, I could say I'm not a fan, but do you have it in your unit at all? And when you bring CPAP, if the baby fails, do you put them on high flow instead? Um, we have 25 units already, and 24 of them um, follow the CPAP meaning as I showed you. No, they don't go with the high flow. And the one person who is converting now. Uh, he was big proponent of um, speaks worldwide, very well known. And I think I'll be very cautious. Now, if you look at the high flow nasal um, Canada data coming from the major group in the, of the hipster trial and all, all those trials, um, especially um, there may be some room in as uh, if we can define that baby. Um, but uh, in our hands, uh, we are better off um, getting the baby off. Uh, respiratory support with CPAP than with hypronasal. Canada it has plus points um, of, with developmental care and also, but it prolongs the area. And I'm concerned there is data 
on increased morbidity uh, when high flow is used to wean babies off. Regarding MAPPV, 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 MAPPV,
And then it, uh, it also depends where your bottle, where, where your bubbler is. You, you, most of these babies are sick and they are in the isolate. So whether that 80 dB reaches the baby, I, I'm not sure. So suddenly when we use the in the oscillation and use a, a high frequency oscillatory ventilation, the noise levels are, I don't know the exact dB levels, but they, those are all improved. And I think one of the context is that whatever those noise levels are, they are not reaching the baby in an isolate. That's a very good thing. I just want to ask you one thing. Have you ever used nasal masks? Like you were, all your uh, slides you were discussing about the uh, nasal prompts. So, uh, if you are unfortunate that you get a septal injury, or if you get a baby from an outside hospital, it's very common um, that there is a big septal injury. Um, so, those are the scenarios where we would use a nasal mask. But in, in small babies, um, it's all high nasal problems. If the septum gets Damage, but uh, and you don't want to intubate the baby because we do nasal intubations too. Our all our intubations are nasal, so a septal damage is also if we can't, you know, baby needs to be intubated to be an oral intubation. If we can get away with CPAP, we would do masking. Another question: Are there any studies comparing? We are talking that now uh, the bubble CPAP is working almost like that of HFOV, high frequency. Sorry? In one of yeah, we, we have talked people talking about it. Um, it is very HFOV with the mask is an effective way of uh, removing CO2. Um, that's been shown, but whether it means anything from the short term um, BPD, uh, I'm still waiting for the day. So at, at present now there are no uh, nothing uh, towards supporting. Now that nasal, most of, some of the new ventilators are coming with uh, nasal uh, HFOV facility. Uh, any studies comparing the CPAP with nasal HFOV? No, not that I'm aware of. Now, uh, the, my good friend, Indian friend Mukherjee talks a lot from, uh, he's at Toronto. Um, they are the ones who are pioneers in doing nasal HFOV. I'm yet to see any study showing um, uh, outcome data on comparative on CPAP versus, uh, again, this is something relatively new. and. Um, as I said, I mean, I've, we would like to see studies which show, you know, you can decrease the CPAP in, in our case from 8-9% to lower than that, I would then definitely look at it. But as for the literature is concerned, I don't think so there is data out there comparing CPAP versus HFOV. You have to keep in mind, when people do the study, they have to be good at doing both these things. You can't compare ventilation with CPAP if you are very good at doing ventilation and not so good at CPAP or vice versa. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we wind up this uh, excellent session, even though we don't want to. But I want to just conclude with few remarks. Have you did I have access to see my book published uh, a few years back? Because I think. Uh, the uh, foundation of thing was the CPAP book. And that give me one. Uh, and, and not, not only I have it, but I have the original. <laughs> you beat me, Rakesh. You really beat me with this. And we improve. I have the original. Oh, my God. And it's, and it's I think, autographed by you, too. Sorry, I feel very ashamed. <laughs> I'm a man of God's sacred keeping my book. <laughs> no, you know, everything. That's why you have all um, no, I, I think um, if you're done, I really, really need to thank you. And um, to my Indian colleagues, I would just say, you know, we are privileged, we are lucky. God has put us in a situation where we've been able to experience something different. And I personally feel I'm that stage in my life where it's time to give. 
I think I've gotten a lot from Todd. And uh, if I can be of any help to any help to anyone, and um, I, for those reasons, I thank Raji to really, really I mean, to persist. I Means um, you should all know we were almost calling this off a week ago. We, there was no way we were going to connect. There was no possible. I made phone calls and people said you're crazy. This cannot be done on YouTube. And uh, I am not that savvy. And um, I don't know how he pulled it out. Um, and I should thank you and your technical team. And it's hard to believe that I can sit here in New York and share this great experience with you all. And uh, thank you very much for your patience. And um, my offer is open for anyone. If you ever want to visit, if you're visiting New York, just drop me a line. And um, I think when you see life, with their open eyes and um, own eyes, uh, it will make the difference. And that made, made the difference. And like many, I train in many places, India, England, and um, in New York. But once I came to Columbia 32 years ago, I never left. Because that's what I believe and uh, goes in fact. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So now I uh, conclude this session. And uh, I was really humbled when such an eminent person has kept my first edition of my CPA book as a reference point. But this is the start of a era what uh, uh, Dr. told that this is a legacy which should continue. That the CMAC will continue every two months. So all of you be prepared. And today I think they started off in a very nice way with the world renowned authority showing my modest effort with CPAP. So I thank you all for coming and making this a very grand success. This will go on to YouTube and hopefully our viewers in India and all will benefit from this. And in fact, the questions are extremely relevant and focused. And I thank you all for coming and joining me in a grand success. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rakesh. Uh, it was uh, excellent and thank you for spending your time as well. And, uh, Is that Venki? Is that Raju? No, Sridhar. Sridhar, Sridhar is coming. Oh. Thank you. So, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Rajiv and Dr. Rakesh for uh, I mean, supporting this event as well. And, as I said earlier, it's Dr. Rajiv's effort, and uh, hopefully we will have many more. And as you rightly said, the quality of academic discussion was great, and all the seniors pitched in, and hopefully this will continue the power. So choice of topics and uh, choice of speakers, he has a good connection with a lot of international speakers like Dr. Rakesh, so we can make use of the conversation. Yeah, of course, the time zone and things work work. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the technical support. Thank you, Rakesh. Thank you. Okay, bye. 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 Thank you. You can't join us for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good food. How for dinner? We already spoke daily, you know, but all of this is an eye opener to you. What you want to say, what is the next class? This is an eye opener. And by God's grace, the connection didn't break. Yeah. By God, you won't believe it.